which was a finalist for the National Books uh, Critics Circle Award and Los Angeles Times Book Prize, and most recently, Dark Baldwin. He was also a co editor with Charles Dexter and Ed Hirsch of uh, A William Maxwell Portrait. His translation of Euripides' Medea appeared in 2006, and a collection of essays, Make Us Way Back, in 2007. He's the editor of two anthologies of poetry, The Wesleyan Tradition and The New American Poets, a Frederick Anthology, and he's received many awards and honors, among them a Guggenheim, two National Endowment for the Arts fellowships, and Discovery the Nation Award. He's a poet laureate of Maryland from 2001 to 2004, and is co-director of the Creative Writing Program at the University of Maryland. Um, since 1995, he's directed the Broadway Writers Conference in Melbourne, Vermont, the longest-running writers conference in the country. And we're really pleased to say that his work has appeared in Summer Chase, uh, in issue 17, which is um, He participated in online poets Q&A on our website, and most especially, I am happy to have him here um, because he was my first professor of poetry at the University of Maryland, and um, I can say that he's not just a wonderful poet, but he's a wonderful teacher, as I'm sure most of you know, and we're just really happy to have him here.
what idiot, lying, fearful, unnumbed part of me assented to the third injection I know well. For who can refrain from administering the shock or current, cinching the collar, or denouncing the illiberal rule laid down for the liberal cause? Who can concede to better judgment and be grateful for the stranger who leads you from the road and stays until the cops arrive or wave off the final swab of numbing gel that brought me to the brink again beneath Dr. Friendly's masked, inscrutable face? Do you know what nominal determinism is? That's when you have a name that if I was, my name was, well, actually, if I were a coal, a coal miner, because that's what my name means, coal miner or coal carrier. So if you were Tim Baker and you turned out to be a baker, that's nominal determinism. It's everywhere in the world. It's like faith that you have to believe in. Embrace. The great flowery dress of my seventh grade teacher, cotton or rayon, pillowcase for her vast mothering bosom, scented with the perfume of the unmarried, stretched over hips that made arms of the lamp I sat on. You were the handkerchief of my remorse just once. You with your bright roses and tulips, spidery paths of vines and fluted leaves, all the smothering penance that nearly consoled me until above my sobs I heard hers, and in her arms the crushing force or the grateful fury of our unburdening made that embrace a thing apart. O oh, heartsick woman, O oh, bewildered boy. My father's knee. At 92, my father's knee is a harsh, dread spectacle betrayed by Bermuda shorts. Girdled in elastic, the cat, collared like an eye, is blind to everything but motion's pain. And this it sees so clearly, my father rarely moves, except to pee or shit or eat or sleep. And sometimes even these he can't negotiate. And yet the short up knee is beautiful in its boundary stake refusal to yield to the arthritic foot that's ready for its shoe. Uh, grandmother with mink stole Sky Harbor Airport, Phoenix, Arizona, 1959. I've never written a title that long. Uh, it could be just easily something else, but um, actually, uh, each bit of information there is, is, I think it's necessary for the poem. So, Grandmother with Mink Stole, Sky Harbor Airport, Phoenix, Arizona, 1959. It rode on her shoulders, flayed in its purposes of warmth and glamour. Its head, like a small dog's, and its eyes more sympathetic than my mother's eyes kindness, which was vast. Four paws for good luck, but also tiny sandbags of mortification and ballast, and in the black claws a hint of brooch or clasp. Secured like that, the head could loll, and the teeth and the snout's fixed grin was the clenched, oh shit, of roadkill askew in the gut. This she wore no matter the weather and always, always when she stepped from the plane and paused at the top of the rolling stairs, she fit her hand to her brow against the glare of concrete and desert. Not a white glove's soft salute, but a visor that brought us into focus, mother and father waiting first, then oldest to youngest, dressed in our Easter best, we were prodded to greet her, she who gripped the hot, gleaming rail, set her teeth in the mink's stiff grin, and walked through the waterless, 
smokeless mirage between us. She who wore the pelt, the helmet of blue hair, and came to us mint and camphor scented, more strange than her unvisited world of trees and seasons, offering us two mouths, two sets of lips, two expressions, the large averted one we were meant to kiss, and the other small, pleading, that if we had the choice, we might choose. Ode to Cyclops. <clears throat> My grandfather's right eye was a frozen slab of milk-white ice that light never thawed. And when he slept, the lid didn't drown the curse of its constant stare. Look at it long and he'd be salt, stone, fear's hard form. And look, we did it. Though we blinked against its spell, the worm or ray or evil thread of its insistence. I'd watch him read with half his face alive and the other like a tool, oil, hanging from a hook as if you could take it in your hands and make it work, but you couldn't. The eye that saw the words counted money, lit his pipe and bet on horses at the track. It measured out his evening whiskey and led him to the thresholds of our rooms to say goodnight. Oh, calm, wheeled-eyed giant, you might have tamed us had we let you hold our hands the way you wanted, or stood beside you closer when we looked into the sun and forced a smile. But your hands were colder, more distant than your gaze, and standing in our doorway, your head was like a moon, vast and disappearing, occupied by all its phases, and so we tried to pass unseen, unknown, even as we sharpened and heated the stake of our revulsion and plotted when to thrust the smoldering tip, not into the eye that roved and guided, but into the one that monitored the smoky, ice-stung realm inside your skull. Now that you're gone, lift your curse, look at us more clearly, with whichever eye condones forgiveness. This is called In Certain Situations. I'm very much against bird song. The last book I wrote had birds everywhere in it. <laughs> and uh, so this, as much as anything, is a happy response to that book. When poets put the sound of birdsong in poems, it's a form of baby talk that gives me the creeps. <laughs> what do you think? Chirrip, chirrip. Do you remember the well-known poet who used to wear a chicken outfit? He wasn't advertising fast food. He wasn't a school mascot. What was he? cock a doodle do. There are all kinds of things to describe about birds, but to phoneticize their songs? Try writing the sound a hummingbird makes trapped behind glass stapled over a window. One time a bird flew into a window and after a while got up. I've written a poem about it. Another time a bird flew into a window and broke its neck. I took its picture and buried it. Hush, little baby, don't say a word. Papa's going to buy you a mockingbird was a song I sang to my young sons endlessly. And if that mockingbird won't sing, Papa's going to buy you a diamond ring. And every time I sang it, lines from Randall Jarrell's The Mockingbird ran through my head, i.e., a mockingbird can sound like anything, or the bat squeak, night is here, the bird's cheap, day is gone. Jarrell's birds talk in Marianne Moore's American English, the kind cats and dogs can understand. Sometimes singing to my sons, I'd fall asleep in the middle of a phrase, and my son would wake me mercilessly. Papa, Papa, sing. About birdsong, I'm not one to talk. A 
for that matter, sing. And singing is something Wallace Stevens Blackbird never does. Not a note, not an inflection or innuendo. Although in another poem, he says, the birds are singing in the yellow patios, and from oriole to crow, note the decline in music. And for all his purple, the purple bird must have notes for his comfort. Poetry, Stevens told us, is a finicking thing of air. Don't know about that poem. It's a, it's a relatively new one. I didn't like the opening of it, though. Sure, sure. Okay. Uh, this is a new poem, too. It's called Laylaps. And Laylaps is a, a mythical hunting dog who uh, never failed to corner his prey. Whatever he went after, Laylaps got. And um, <clears throat> there's a long involved story, uh, many stories, that eventually put him uh, on the, uh, the tail of, so to speak, a fox. Who had whose, whose power was never to be caught. Okay. So you can see the, the problem here. In, uh, in the myth, this fox uh, was, a, was a male, but I, I needed to change that. Laylaps. When it was clear I would never catch her, and that she would never escape my pursuit, Zeus intervened and turned each of us to stone. No longer was ardor our faith. No longer were days marked by bramble giving way to bog, by razory reeds that cut our swift passing. Days when all I saw of her was airborne, arrowy, a silvery shimmer and flash of scud. And gone too, the late night stillness, when I paused, not thinking to lose her, but hoping Ahead of my silence, she'd slow down and turning, see, snout up, tongue lively, lightly panting, undiscouraged, how at the edge of our distance I stood, wishing she'd invite my approach. But these are dog thoughts, and I was God's hound by way of Europa, Minos, Propris, so much passing on of love's troubles I was meant to end. Who wouldn't want to die in the monumental stillness? Who wouldn't want to be frozen in their last untaken step, translated like we were, my pointer stance, her backward glance, and the vast sky where the gods below had safely placed us? Bees of Der Kifa. The, uh, I, could, I couldn't find it. Uh, the Bees of Der Kifa. The sun going down is lost in the gorge to the south, lost in the rows of olive trees, light in the webs of their limbs. This is the time when the thousands and thousands come home. It is not the time for the keeper's veil and gloves, not the time for stoking the smoker with pine needles. It would be better to do that at midday, under a hot sun, when the precincts are quiet. It would be better to disturb few rather than many. At noon, the hives are like villages, gates open toward the sun, or like small countries carved from empires to keep the peace, each with its habits, some ruled better by better queens, some frantic and uncertain, some with drifting populations, Others busy with robbing, and even the wasps and 
hornets, the fierce invaders who have settled among the natives or involved in the ancient trades. But now, with the sun gone, the blue summer twilight tinged with thyme, and the silver underside of olive leaves calm in the furrowed rose, darkening the white chunks of limestone exposed in the tillage, the keeper in his vestment squeezes the bellows of the smoker, blows a thin blue stream into an entrance, loosens the top like a box lid, and delivers more. For a while, the hive cannot understand what it says to itself. Now a single babel presides in the alleys and passageways, and as block by block the keeper takes his senses, he could go ungloved, unveiled, if it weren't for the unpacified, the unconfused, returning, mouths gorged with nectar, legs orange with pollen, landing, amassing, alerting the lulled to scale their wax trellis, or find the gloves worn thumb, the hood's broken zipper, and plant the eviscerating stinger. And I'll finish with this poem. It's called An Individual History. This was before the time of lithium and Zoloft. Before mood, stabilizer, before mood stabilizers and anxiolytics and almost all the psychotropic drugs. But not before Thorazine, which the suicidal Lachlan called handcuffs for the mind. It was before, during, and after the time of atomic fallout, Auschwitz, the Nakba, DDT. And you could take water cures, find solace in quarantines, participate in shunnings, or stand at Lourdes among the canes and crutches. It was when the march of time kept taking off its boots, Fridays when families prayed the living rosary to neutralize communists with prayer, when electroshock was electrocution, and hammers recognized the purpose of a nail. And so, if you were as crazy as my maternal grandmother was then, you might make the pilgrimage she did through the wards of state and private institutions, and make of your own body a nail for pounding, its head sunk past quagmires, coups d'etat, and disappearances. And in this way, find a place in history among the detained and unparoled, an individual like her, though head hidden by an epic of lean notation, marked Parkinsonian tremor, chronic paranoid type, a time when the animal, slowed by its fate, was excited to catch a glimpse of its tail, or feel through her skin the dulled over joy when for a moment her hands were still. Thank you.